All right, so uh, last time, of course, the uh, Lord's Supper was instituted. Uh, we celebrated communion as a result of that. Uh, and now as we move forward, the next event in his ministry is he has his 11. Uh, Judas has been expelled, and he's about to be betrayed. And between the betrayer leaving and the betrayal, he has some final things to say to his disciples. And that's John chapter 14, 15, and 16, which he concludes with his prayer in chapter 17. And of course, we're not doing all that today, but we're going to look at uh, a, a radical statement that uh, divides, separates all men. You either believe what he says or you don't believe what he says. It's no more complicated than that. So we begin in John chapter 14, verse 1, which says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Uh, why does Jesus say, let not your heart be troubled? Because their hearts are troubled. <laughs> he knows their emotional state. Uh, he knows what they're thinking. And putting ourselves in their spot, uh, they've heard... Uh, Jesus say that not all 12 of them are clean. Uh, they've heard him say that one of them is going to betray him this very night into the hands of his enemies. Uh, he's heard him say to them that he's going to be leaving. Uh, they've heard him say that one of them, the, the loudest of them, uh, is going to deny him three times before the sun comes up, saying that he doesn't even know him. Uh, he's, they've heard him say that they're all going to scatter. This night, they're all going to scatter. They're going to abandon him. They're going to fail him. And then we had the celebration of the Lord's Supper with broken body and poured out blood. And so they are troubled. I think we all would be troubled. What's the uh, cure for that? Uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. The cure for a troubled soul. The cure for a troubled spirit is God. Believe in him. Trust in him. Lean on him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No man has seen God. No, not one. But he's given us more evidence and we need to know that he is there, that he hears, he cares, and he acts. Just when we are troubled, believe in him. And what else does he say? Uh, believe also in me. Believe in the Father, believe in the Son. And with that comes peace. With that comes rest. If we don't put our faith in the, the living God, then we put our faith in ourselves or someone else. And in ourselves and in anybody else, there is no peace, there is no rest. There's only peace and rest in the Almighty living God. Uh, and we see examples of that in Scripture. We, we read one this morning. Uh, a psalm of David, Psalm 42. Uh, before he, after he was anointed to be king, and before he actually became king, uh, many trials, many tribulations. He was on the run. He was being hunted. There are many of the psalms of David. When you are troubled, go to the psalms of David and read them. They start out as you probably would be feeling uh, troubled, but by the time he he's got his attention on the Lord. By the time he's done, he's singing praises. There's been a, a healing as he's turned to the Lord. And in, in chapter 42, verse 5 that we read this morning, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. When you're cast down, when you're discouraged, when you're troubled, when you're agitated, when you're fearful, when you're confused, turn to God. He is the cure for all those things. Uh, another example in David's life is during those times when he was on the run, uh, he was out doing stuff with his men, and Malachites came through and took everyone and everything. And they came back to their home base, and even his mighty men, which had been so faithful to him, they were so distraught, they wanted to stone him. David was alone absolutely alone but he really wasn't because in first samuel chapter 30 verse 6 we read that david was greatly distressed 
For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. And the Lord told him, go. I'm going to return all that stuff to you. And, and they went. Uh, encourage yourself in the Lord. The Word of God is given for our encouragement and our edification and our comfort. When you're troubled, turn to the Lord. Get into His Word. Now, stepping back a little bit, if you will, and taking a look at verse 1, let's consider what Jesus is saying. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Believe in God, believe in me. What's he saying? Well, if we consider what the law says, and Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, uh, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, the Ten Commandments. The first one being, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. You will worship no one but me. And in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, Thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now Jesus is saying, You believe in God, believe also in me. So he is either breaking the law and instructing his disciples to also break the law, or he is saying that he is God. And of course, we know that he is. Verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Uh, I'm going to the Father. Where, where, does, where does the Father live? Where does he hang out? Uh, in eternity. We call it heaven. Heaven. Uh, Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The Father inhabits eternity, which means he transcends the creation because the creation is confined by space and time. He's outside all of that. Uh, And he says in his Father's house, in in heaven, in eternity, are many mansions. Now, the mansion is not like the Queen of England's, or even Jed Clampett's, for that matter. Uh, It means abode. It means a residence. What's the nature of these residences? Well, they're not earthly because heaven is not earthly. They're heavenly. They're heavenly abodes and residences. If you join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, known as the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, We'll begin in verse 42. It says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It's speaking of, the, before that, talking about different kinds of bodies. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood 
cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, natural, earthy, must put on incorruption, spiritual, heavenly. And this mortal must put on immortality. So we have a natural body. You see one looking back at you. I, I see natural bodies, but there's also spiritual bodies. Now, if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, begin reading in verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, that though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That's the Spirit in us. And our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know, we know, that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You see, man was created in the image of God. And God took some dust to the ground and he formed, he created Adam and he breathed into him and Adam became a living soul. There is body their soul, there is spirit. God is spirit. Uh, therefore, because there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body, you're not looking at me. You can't see me. This is not the real me. This is the temporary place where I'm living in a, a body made out of the dust of the earth. And if you were to take a, a dirt clod and chemi do some chemical analysis on it, you'd probably find 17 different elements. If you take a chunk out of my skin, do that same chemical analysis, you'd find the very same 17 elements. And this is passing away. And dust will return to dust. I'm just living here for a little while. Some number of days that I don't know. It's temporary. This is where I live temporarily on earth. Body is not me. I'm not the body. It's just where I am. This body is designed to be uh, inhabited on, on earth. And fearfully and wonderfully made an amazing, amazing creation. The human body is a testimony that there is a creator, but it's made from the dust. Now, as we read in Second Corinthians, uh, someday I'll move out. This body is becoming, it is temporary. It's becoming more high maintenance. Uh, it's becoming, uh, well, decaying, let's say. It's, we're downgrading, not decaying yet. Uh, things are downgrading. Amen. Not getting better. It's the downhill slide, if you will. But this living space uh, is going to come to an end. And I'm going to move out of it. And I'm going to move into a perfect, immortal, eternal space 
a spiritual body, a body that is designed to inhabit heaven in the presence of God. It's made from, I have no idea. I don't know. We'll find out when we get one. But it'd be a glorified body. Uh, now, what does that glorified body look like? I don't know, but um, we will see as we get through the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was risen in a glorified body. Did they recognize him? Uh, Mary didn't. She thought he was a gardener until he spoke. What about the disciples? Uh, maybe, maybe, but it was when he spoke. Uh, there was something different. Rec you know, similar, I guess, but different. Because it's designed for, for heaven, which is where Jesus would return. So, going back to Matthew, or it's not Matthew, John chapter 14. In my Father's house, eternity, are many mansions, bodies, spiritual bodies. If it were not so, I would have told you. So it's what, that's true, right? Jesus said it. It's true. Uh, otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have said it because he doesn't lie. He's God. He cannot lie. Uh, he came to speak the Father's words, and the Father's words are true. In fact, they are the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega of truth. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. From eternity to eternity, the words of the Father are true. The words of the, of the Father will never change. Psalm 119, again, all about the Word of God. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's not going to change. It's done. The, Father words, the Father's words are true. They're a blessing for those who hear them and receive them. Just like David, when he had it in his heart to build a house for God... The Lord flipped a script on him, if you will, and said, you know, I, did I ever ask anybody for a house? Uh, I'm going to make your house different. From your house will come the Messiah, and his kingdom will be forever. And David is humbled. He's overwhelmed, and he, he goes and prays to the Lord. And in verse 28 of Second Samuel chapter 7, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. And thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. The promises that we read that comfort us, you know, when we're troubled in spirit and we go to the word of God and we're comforted and we're encouraged, they're all true. They're all true. And they will always be true. And so Jesus came to speak the words of the Father and the Father's words are true. Therefore, believe Jesus. Which is exactly what he says there in verse 1. Now at the end of Verse 2, he goes, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. I go before you. He's going before them. He's going before us. And it, it was foretold in the law, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. There was a shadow of the angel that went before the nation of Israel as they were led out of Egypt to the promised land. Cloud by day, fire by night. An angel was with them. In Exodus 23, verse 20, Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, to keep thee in the way, and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. He's leading them out of bondage into their inheritance, a place that he's prepared for them. That's a shadow of Jesus. Jesus is the substance. Uh, he's going before us to prepare a place for us. And he has led us, for those who do believe, he has led us out of 
bondage and is leading us to our inheritance. Uh, so he's going to the Father. He came from the Father to do what the Father gave him to do and to say what the Father gave him to say. And he's going to return to the Father and he's telling this to the eleven. And because he's going back to heaven, these three chapters are really monumental uh, for us to consider. Uh, but when he gets there, as it says in the, in the early part here, when he gets to heaven, he's going to be preparing. <laughs> he's going to be making ready a place for us, a body for us. Now, he's promised this to 11 disciples. Right there in front of him are the 11 disciples. Uh, I'm going to go, then I'm going to come back, and I will receive. I will take you where I am, that where I am you may be also. Now, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared in his glorified body to them a couple of times, and then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. He did, in fact, return to heaven. So when did Jesus do what he said to them, receiving them unto himself? When did he do that? Uh, individually, after their last breath. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He was faithful to his word. Well, what about us? When is he going to come to us and receive us unto himself? That we might be where he is. When's is he going to do that? Well, one of two ways. Either individually, with our last breath, or on the family plan called the rapture. Either way, we'll be absent from the body, present with the Lord. He promised this to the eleven he did it. He promises that to us, he'll do it. There's comfort in that. There's peace in that. Verse 4. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Uh, he's going to the Father. He's told them that. And he's going to prepare a place for them. Uh, and he's told them, you know the way that I'm going. Because he's foretold them that at least four times uh, in his ministry. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to, be, he's going to suffer at the hands of his enemies. He's going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to rise again on the third day. That's the way. To heaven is that way. Verse 5. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Uh, uh, time out, Jesus. We don't know where you're going. So how can we possibly know the way? How are we to follow you if we don't know where you're going? You see, there's even in this late hour, even the number of times that he told them how this thing ends, they're holding on to their preconceived ideas about the Messiah and about the kingdom of God and how all these things happen. They still don't understand. But again, they're not born again yet either. Verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is one of those radical statements that Jesus said, all of which divide men into two camps. You either believe what he says or you don't believe what he says. There's not a third option. This is one of them. There are uh, eight I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am, uh, of course, evokes the burning bush. The Lord speaking to Moses in the burning bush. Uh, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when Moses says, Well, who you're sending me, but who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. And so when Jesus says, I am, he's saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. And there are eight times he says that in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the life, the way, the truth, and the life. 
I am the true vine. Repeatedly, Jesus says things that must be considered. You believe it or you don't. But it's very plain. So in this one, verse 6, I am the way, the singular, exclusive. It's not built on consensus. It's not inclusive. It's exclusive. There's no compromise. There's no coexist. He is the way, meaning road or means to get to heaven. Uh, there's a, a song, Highway to Heaven. It's a lie. And there's not a highway to heaven. There's a narrow way to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven. All roads lead to heaven. That's a lie. Jesus is the way. So the way to heaven, the way into the presence of the Father is a person, is Jesus. And therefore, our way to heaven is in Christ. Uh, I am the truth. The, again, singular, exclusive. Truth is not a matter of consensus. It's not inclusive of all beliefs. There is no compromise of it, and there's no coexisting with other things. The truth is a person. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The truth is not a, a proposition. It's not an idea. It's not a creed. It's not a religion. It's not a philosophy. It's a person. And as therefore, as a person, truth is relational. It's not relative. It's relational, uh, which is difficult for the unbeliever to accept. Uh, especially, it seems like today in our humanistic society, uh, truth is a very unstable thing. People say things that they say are true, and they, it can't possibly be true. Uh, if that's true, then that can't be true, but that's true. So that Truth has become relative to meet the, the needs and the desires of the person speaking. Uh, truth is getting uh, revised, being rewritten. History is being rewritten to fit an agenda. So truth is under attack. And most certainly, Jesus is under attack. Truth is a person. It is Jesus. Uh, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Singular, exclusive. Not inclusive. There's no compromise on this truth. He is the source of life. John chapter 1, verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is eternal life life. John 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Just like the way, just like the truth, the life is a person. It's Jesus. It's not a heartbeat. <laughs> it's not a pulse. It's a person. And what Jesus is saying no man cometh unto the Father by me. There's absolutely, absolutely no other way. There is no other truth and there is no other life that leads to the Father in heaven. There are other ways and other truths, but they don't lead to heaven. They lead to hell. The way, the life, and the truth is not good works. It's not self-righteousness. Uh, it's not based on our merit. It's not how much money we have. It's a person, Jesus. And you either believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, or you don't. But if you want to go to heaven to be in the presence of your maker, he's the only way. Uh, it, this is, these are God's words. His way, His truth, His life. 
And if those are rejected, well, then there's no way. And there's no truth. And there's no life. It's binary. And any, anyone who attempts to broaden the way, broaden the truth, and broaden the life is a false teacher. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 15 Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way. That leadeth to destruction. And many be and many there be which go in thereat, because straight, narrow. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. There's only one way. There's only one truth. There's only one life. All those things are a person, the Son of God. And so the only possible and the only acceptable access mankind has to the presence of God is Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between man and God, that man, Jesus Christ. And like I said, uh, those who do not believe, because these words, you know, Jesus said, I did not come with peace. I came with a sword. He came to divide. Those who do not believe the absolute that Jesus is speaking have a real trouble with those who share it with them. We're called narrow-minded, right? I've been called narrow-minded. Well, I didn't make it up. God said it. I didn't. I believe it. And I'm going to be in the presence of of the Father in heaven, and I want you to be in the presence of the Father. You have to believe it. Well, no, it's it's not that narrow. Well, I liken it to, to mathematics. Mathematics is, to me, narrow. There's one correct answer. It's right or it's wrong. Uh, do we complain about math being narrow? Or maybe is there liber, uh, liberty in understanding the math and applying the math? Fifty years ago yesterday, what happened? Men landed on the moon. How did, they, how did that happen? Whoa. The math. They figured out the math. And it wasn't relative. It was absolute. Otherwise, it would, it would never have happened. If you've seen the movie Apollo 13, trouble. They couldn't land. They had to come back. They weren't sure they could get them back. How did they get them back? The math. Slide rules, even. They brought them back. Because the math is not... Relative. It's not why it narrow. There is a right way. So it is with, with God. So the access to heaven is as narrow as Jesus. But it's also as wide as Jesus. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever. That's wide. Whosoever would believe. Verse 7, Jesus continues, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. So to know, what Jesus is saying, to know me is to know the Father. He's already said the Father and I are one. uh, And therefore he's saying to the eleven there, to see me, to discern me, is to discern the Father. Because no man has seen God. The only begotten Son has declared him. The Son who came down from heaven. Verse 8. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Now, think about the question. What's, what's Philip really asking? I want to see God. Doesn't every man have that question? Should. I want to see God. That's what Philip is asking. Verse 9, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? 
He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Philip, I've been with you 24-7 for over two years now. Don't you know me? Have you, you considered my words and considered my works? If you can see me, then you see the Father. Well, Scripture tells us that Jesus is the faithful and true witness of God to man. And he is. But here we are, hours away from their world absolutely coming apart. The, 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 these 11 disciples still don't have their eyes opened to who Jesus really is. He's 100% man. Yes. He's 100% God. Yes. As evidenced by the things that he has said and the things that he has done. Don't you know me? Why, do you, why are you asking to see God? Just look at me. Verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Going back to verse 1. Believe in God, believe also in me. If Jesus said, if you're able to discern me, to see me, you will see the Father. Because the Father is in me, one with him. And Jesus is in one with the Father. Jesus was with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory. The Father sent the Son to reveal himself to mankind in his Son. And Jesus came to do the will of his Father. Having a conversation with the woman at the well uh, in Samaria, John 4, verse 34, and then the disciples came back. They came with lunch. I'm not hungry. What? Uh, he says, my meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. He came to do the will of the Father. He set aside his will to do the Father's will. Jesus came to speak the Father's words in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18, verses 18 and 19. It said, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. It shall come to pass whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name I will require it of him. And some of those words are, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, in John chapter 7, Jesus told the Pharisees who were attacking him for the things he said, wait, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. When we share the gospel, truth, with someone, and they reject it and get hostile, get personal, get offended, I, I didn't make this stuff up. These are the, this is God's doctrine. These are his truths. Um, Jesus came to do the Father's works. In John chapter 5, verse 19, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. The Father is in the Son. The Son is in the Father. They're one with. Can't divide one. The Father does it. The Son does it. So, Jesus telling the eleven, believe his works. Believe his words. Both are evidence of his deity. Verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father uh, Jesus did some pretty amazing things did he not he said some amazing things well he's telling the eleven that hey, I'm going to the father 
And when I'm gone, you guys are going to do greater works than these. We read in the first three verses of Acts of the Apostles, the former treatise I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. By the time Luke wrote this, the Son was at the right hand of the Father. And he's written what we call the Gospel of Luke. He's been inspired to write those words. And that just talks about the things Jesus began to do. He's going to continue the things that Jesus was doing and teaching until the day in which he was taken up after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then the ascension. But the words and the works of Jesus continue to this day. They did not stop when he ascended into heaven. It continues to this day. And Jesus said to the eleven, and he's saying to us, that there will be even greater things done by those disciples. Well, what does that mean? You know, has anybody raised anybody from the dead recently? Ever? <laughs> no. Uh, it's a numeric concept greater in number. There are going to be many voices rather than one voice. He is the Word of God. He came to speak the Father's words. He's the voice of God. But now there are many voices. There will be many works and many workers of the Father's work, not just one. I came to seek and save the lost. That's the Father's work, being busy about the Father's business. He was one. Now there are many. It's a much greater work then. And those things are being done in many places, globally, not just in one place. They're in a strip of land that we call Israel. And so how is the work of one, capital O, how is the work of one made greater by his disciples? By the Holy Spirit. And he's going to talk a lot about the Holy Spirit in chapters 14 and 15 and 16. Preparing his men for what was coming and who was coming. And he concludes verse 12. Because I go unto my Father. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare, go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So there's no doubt where he's going. We don't know where you're going. We don't know. I'm going to the Father, the Father who inhabits eternity. I'm returning to eternity. Now, if we look back in chapter 13, look at verses 36 and 37. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not, why can I, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Where is Jesus going? To the Father. Where is the Father? In eternity. He's going to get a glorified body and return there. A resurrected body. Resurrection requires death. Why, why can't Peter go now? His work isn't done here. He doesn't have a glorified body. He's got a body suitable for living on earth. He doesn't have a body that will be allowed into heaven. So that's the answer 
to Peter's question. I go to the Father. Oh. <laughs> and I think as we consider Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him despised the shame, the shame of the cross. What was the joy? I think it's multidimensional, but what's one of the dimensions of the joy that was set before Jesus that he was looking through the cross to? Going to the Father. Being in the presence of his Father again. So, this passage of Scripture, some things we need to take away from it. At the risk of repeating myself, are you troubled? Are you confused? Are you doubtful? Are you discouraged? Are you fearful? What's the cure? Faith. Believe in God. Believe in Jesus. Go to Him. Seek Him in prayer. Go to the Word to receive the comfort and the encouragement and the edification that is for us. Find the peace that you need in who? In God. There's no peace in knowing how or when or where or why when all these things that happen to us that trouble us, there's no peace in any answers to those questions. There's peace only in the question, who? And that who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and our Father who is in heaven. Go to him. Go to them. Put your faith. Lean on them. And when you're troubled, a good place to go in Scripture, Psalms of David. Secondly, same, same verse, verse 1. What, what does our Maker want from us? He wants us to believe Him. He wants us to trust Him, to lean on Him, to be dependent upon Him, not ourselves and not anyone else. Because he alone is holy. He alone is pure. He alone is almighty. Trust me. Believe me. If we flip to John chapter 20. The last verse in John chapter 20, verse 31 well, 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's what our Creator wants from us to believe, to have life. Because we have a sin nature. We're born spiritually dead, physically alive, but spiritually dead. He wants us to have his life. And it's a gift. Must be accepted. Must believe all the radical things that Jesus has said. And trust him. Because if you want to go to heaven, <laughs> uh, come to Jesus and follow him. And at some appointed day, known only by him, he will come and receive us unto himself that we might be where he is. And he is in the presence of the Father. In the meantime, just as Jesus said to Philip and the other ten, if you see me, you see the Father. The Father is in me and I am in him. Well, one with well, he sent us into the world that people would see him and hear him. So the people in our spheres of influence will see Jesus in us when we deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. He is in us. We are in him. The world needs to see Jesus and at is in us, the Spirit of Christ, 
indwelling in us and empowering us to go and to say and to do the things that he has in mind for us to do. So, lay down your will for Jesus' will. Speak his words. Do his work. Let your light shine. Amen.